Hello everyone. On behalf of Indian National Trust for Art and Culture Heritage, INTAC, and the INTAC Conservation Institute, I extend a very warm welcome to our speaker, Professor Jacinta Jung, and everyone who has taken the time out to join us for today's talk. I am Dr. Padma Rohina, Director, ICI Delhi. The aim of the Conservation Insights Lecture Series by INTAC is to promote an informed discussion on issues and aspects pertaining to the field of heritage conservation by connecting with various experts, institutions from India and abroad. These discussions hopefully will lead to further collaborations and of course an increase in our knowledge base. So far, the response has been very warm and overwhelming both from the speakers as well as participants and we hope that it remains so in future. Today is the first lecture with a collaboration with SUPSI, University of Applied Sciences and Arts of Southern Switzerland. I'm extremely grateful to Professor Jacinta Jong for accepting the request without any hesitation in for organizing these lectures. I would also take this opportunity to thank Dr. Christina Herbst who introduced me to Professor Jong. Now to introduce our speaker for today. Dr. Jiachinta Jong is an architect specializing in the conservation of the built heritage. She graduated from the Polytechnic of Milan and then went on to do her doctorate in sciences from EPFL and PhD in history of architecture and urban planning at the Polytechnic of Turin. She was active as a conservation architect, both in a private profession as well as with universities for many years. And these include the University of Geneva, where she was an invited lecturer, and research activities at the Polytechnic of Milan. From 2005, she is responsible for the bachelor's and the master's degrees in conservation restoration at SUPSI, where she promotes activities in education and research. Her field of research are history and archaeology of the built heritage, history of construction, artist techniques, conservation and restoration of historic monuments, 20th century architecture, and our main publications, which include both books and articles, are on these subjects. Now, title of today's talk is Education and Research in Conservation Restoration. Professor John will give a brief overview of the education system in conservation, restoration in Switzerland, which is based on theoretical lessons and practical activities. She will then be talking about various research, research projects conducted by the Institute of Materials and Construction at SUPSI on 20th century architecture, stucco decorations, dating and mortar technology, plaster models, etc. Before I invite our speaker, may I request all of you to please mute your microphones while the talk is going on. Please use the chat facility to write in any requests, questions, any observations that you would want during the talk. We'll be looking out at the chat and we'll be uh, answering those right at the end of the talk. And now I invite Professor Jochinta Jo. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Padma. And uh, thank you to everybody. Welcome in Switzerland. Now is uh, half past 12, uh, our time and uh, I will be glad to share the time with you and I will do the presentation so I will give you a short introduction of our institution then we will examine one of our projects uh, about stucco decoration more in detail and you will be welcome to make your questions uh, and uh, Padma Rohila is uh, managing the question time after my presentation. Well, I just uh, start uh, sharing you the screen. Um, here you are. And uh, so I'm from uh, SUPSI, it's a technical university. And um, we are in the department of environment construction and design. And uh, in the department, uh, we are part of the Institute of Materials and Construction. As a University of Applied Science and Art, we, um, our tasks are to do education. We have a bachelor and a master program. We offer lifelong learning. 
uh, we do research, mainly applied research, not theoretical research, uh, and uh, we do services uh, for all the people working in the field of conservation. Our team is a multidisciplinary team. So I am an architect. Uh, my colleagues are um, a scientific expert. You will meet in the next days uh, Francesca Piquet. She's a chemist uh, and uh, Marta Caroselli, uh, Patrizia Moretti. They are all experts uh, in the scientific field uh, in conservation science. Uh, then we have uh, conservator restorers, uh, um, photographers, uh, and for us the important topic is really to work uh, in conservation restoration on a multidisciplinary level. For education, in Switzerland uh, you have uh, first a bachelor in conservation, then a master in conservation restoration with uh, three years uh, that uh, bring you to be at technician or a conservation assistant and two more years of specialization with a master, you are becoming a fully qualified conservator restorer. You can go and work and open your independent profession or keep on studying with the PhD programs. In Switzerland, uh, there are four institutions offering conservation restoration education and it at, at university level, and each institution has a different field of specialization. So in the French speaking part of Switzerland, you have mainly archeology span and technical instruments. In the German speaking part of Switzerland, you have uh, architecture and furniture, all the things related with books and photography, painting and sculpture, and modern materials and media. In Rickisberg, uh, you have a specialized institution for textile. And in Lugano, we are mainly working on wall paintings, uh, stone uh, and uh, stucco decoration. If you want to get more information, you can go to our website or at SUPSI or at the Swiss uh, Conservation Restoration. Swiss uh, Conservation Restoration Campus, so Swiss uh, CRC. So wall paintings, uh, uh, stucco decoration, and stone and stone-like materials like plaster or artificial stone. The professional competences we offer to stu students uh, are, oh please, if, if you please can mute your microphone or we do preliminary investigation um, documentation preventive conservation and risk management um, our students uh, are able to perform small uh, tests on materials uh, so they are able to take samples uh, go and do uh, independently some of uh, the scientific analysis but the aim of our education is to make them able to collaborate uh, with conservation scientists uh, so to have a common language and common knowledge without of course uh, being a conservation scientist. Um, to design and realize uh, conservation restoration interventions and uh, of course uh, help uh, the um, appreciation of uh, the artistic value of the works of art. And we offer lifelong learning courses for professional. Like here, some example of a course uh, we recently did uh, about uh, using laser for the cleaning uh, of uh, wall paintings. Services, we provide services for architects, uh, and for conservator restorers or cultural offices uh, working in the fields of um, cultural heritage. And uh, the Institute for Materials and Construction has a specialized uh, conservation restoration unit, uh, and we do uh, different tests uh, on properties of thermical properties of materials. Uh, 
we were involved uh, in a project of uh, on the leaning tower of pisa to study the um, the protective uh, finish uh, for the marble stone of the surface or for example we do analysis of souls presence in churches the different souls uh, and give advice on how to live uh, with these uh, soluble souls uh, how to manage them in a conservation restoration uh, intervention uh, we work a lot uh, with non-invasive mainly non-invasive tests uh, like technical imaging uh, or portable devices like colorimeter colorimeter uh, xrf uh, or working with FTIR and optical microscope. The research areas and projects are mainly on stucco manufacturing technique. We will go deeper in that in a few minutes. And uh, we study also the effects of cleaning on stucco surface. That was uh, a project of a few years ago to understand how different uh, uh, stucco, uh, how different methods uh, can have an impact uh, on the surface. Uh, study the characterization of original and added materials. Uh, we prepared the mock-ups. Uh, we did the test on mock-ups uh, and on mock-ups uh, you can take also big samples uh, to analyze the surface and uh, assessing the effects. Um, we wanted to assess uh, the level of cleanings uh, we, where we could reach uh, and uh, the uh, influence uh, on the original surface. In terms of uh, change of color, the surface abrasion and re the residue or whitewash or other paintings of, or dirt material that uh, we wanted to remove. Taking account also the costs of different technology and health and security for the conservator restorers. We are just starting now a new challenging project uh, to study um, the plaster models uh, of Vincenzo Vela. He's a famous uh, um, Italian and Swiss uh, sculpture and uh, we will bring together documents, uh, uh, document-based research and direct study of the surface and the materials uh, and methods of construction in creating Vela models uh, to explore the role of plasters uh, in the sculpture's working process. Um, we are working a lot about uh, plasters and mortars in conservation, like um, making tests uh, for grouting intervention and um, replacement and uh, repairs in mortars. We are going on a very big project uh, with the UNESCO site uh, at Mustair uh, to study the construction history and the mortar technology. This project um, uh, is investigating the technology of materials uh, by studying mortar fragments uh, collected over 50 years of archeological research uh, to provide uh, information about uh, technological change uh, in uh, making mortar. We are also deeply involved uh, in modern materials. Uh, this could be also an interesting topic uh, for further research. Uh, modern materials, uh, both uh, in art, uh, like in decoration, but also modern materials in architecture, as we have many buildings built in concrete. Uh, so how to study the different technologies of concrete uh, and uh, the conservation issue they have uh, and uh, the minimal intervention in repairing them. Uh, we work uh, in, on 20th century also in uh, polychromies, uh, so in the conservation of colors uh, in 20th century 
art and uh, architecture. We had uh, an interesting project in the, um, this villa that uh, Le Corbusier um, realized uh, for his parents uh, on the lake of Geneva. Uh, so to study the work, the colors used uh, by Le Corbusier. Um, another project uh, you will hear about uh, in the next lectures uh, is about uh, these paintings realized uh, in the French speaking part of Switzerland. They are uh, paintings done between the 1924 and the 1940s. So by this uh, famous painter who was worked a lot in Italy and in Paris. Uh, he was uh, one among uh, the Futurist, uh, so he has uh, uh, a real um, love uh, for experiments, uh, not only in forms and colors, uh, but really in technique to use uh, for wall paintings. Um, we um, have tools to assess uh, conservation treatments. Uh, so, how can you say if conservation treatment is done in a successful, successful? way, so which are the criteria and the means you have. Uh, um, we are studying uh, detached wall paintings uh, now in the collection of the Swiss National Museum. Uh, wall paintings coming from um, the UNESCO site of Mustair, so from the 8th and 9th century, so they are it's, uh, the, uh, more ancient uh, uh, collection in Switzerland of wall paintings. And uh, one of the topic uh, we also cherish very much uh, is uh, uh, monitoring and maintenance plan. In order to develop tools uh, to invite uh, um, architects, uh, cultural or heritage offices uh, and conservator restorer, not just to think at the conservation restoration intervention as something that it makes, uh, I mean, a point uh, in the history or in the um, conservation of, of a building or an, an, uh, an artwork, but as a, as a simple um, moment uh, in, in a longer process of conservation restoration. So, practicing, uh, developing and practicing a long-term conservation actions, which now for, for us, uh, for Switzerland, are quite a crucial point uh, to assure the long being of works of art after conservation. Conservation is not something that is going to be an eternal, but needs uh, constant uh, revision care, monitoring and control and maintenance. And this is what I, are we doing now. So this is uh, the first uh, quick presentation about uh, our activities. And now I will move on to a research project uh, we are working on. And uh, this study has been developed uh, within a research project uh, founded uh, by the um, Swiss National Funds uh, for Scientific Research. We have been working on it uh, in the last uh, three, four years, uh, and now we are quite uh, at the end uh, of it. Uh, between uh, the 16th and the 17th centuries, the stucco makers uh, from Canton Ticino were requested all over Europe uh, to take part in the decoration of uh, the main building project. Uh, so we can find uh, the name in Rome, uh, in Russia, Germany, Austria, Czech Republic, uh, really Chino stucco makers, so coming from the southern part of Switzerland, the part of Switzerland near the Italian border, they were really the best in stucco making for almost uh, two centuries. 
and despite uh, the interest uh, um, for their art, uh, nobody has never analyzed uh, the techniques uh, they used, uh, how they work. And so aim of uh, our project uh, was to understand uh, how the stucco makers uh, coming from the lake of Lugano worked uh, in, their home, in their homeland uh, between the 17th and the, between the 16th and the 17th century and uh, if uh, all the artists uh, used uh, a common modus operandi way of doing if they have such a common recipe something common or if each uh, family or artist uh, worked according to their own established methods. This research, uh, I hope you can see, well, I can't see very well the screen, is something quite reduced, but I will, I will read the few, um, the few sentences. So this research uh, has been conducted with an interdisciplinary approach bringing together different disciplines like art history, uh, theory and practice of art technology, archaeometry and science, uh, uh, replica making, uh, to, to um, put in perspective all the information gathered from a different variety of sources. So from the written documents uh, related to the materials and technique used, they are preserved mainly in parish archives. And so we have uh, building books, contracts, uh, invoices, receipts, and uh, until now, they have been uh, not been explored at all. They have been explored uh, just to know the name of the artist, uh, but not to have information about his working procedure. And for us, uh, they have been a very rich uh, source of information to understand, to have information about the materials and uh, the work on site. Then, of course, uh, direct examination of the works of art gave us information about their technical. And um, if, if you can mute uh, your microphone, if you please can mute your microphone, it would be. That is my experience. Mute all. Yes, uh, okay. And so um, this is uh, um, direct examination. Then we have uh, material analysis. We did some chemical, physical and petrographic analysis to understand uh, the properties uh, of the materials used, but also to compare with archeological approach, uh, the analytical data with the historical and material information we had. Uh, analytical data are a precious resource, but it's important uh, to combine this data with other resource of information. And then uh, we realized the replica uh, to get a better understanding of the artistic process uh, with which uh, stucco decoration was made. During this research, uh, we analyzed uh, deeply about 26 uh, case studies located uh, between Lugano and the Italian border. So this is Lugano, this is the Italian border, this is Como, probably you know better Como. This is uh, the famous lake of Como. And uh, from Lugano to Como, there are just something like 20 kilometers, just to give you an idea of uh, the small area we are speaking. And um, we also reducing uh, the time span of our research. So from the 16th 
to the 17th century and reducing the area being analyzed uh, to this short, uh, I mean, very small area, it's very important um, as we can assume that the artist used uh, or had the possibility to use all the same materials. The provenance was also very local, very the same. And so we could concentrate to find the differences in the technique. Uh, first of all, it's um, useful to give a first definition of stucco. As many conflicting meaning of uh, this term uh, can be found uh, in different contexts. So stucco decoration is an ancient artistic technique used also by the Egyptian or by the Romans that uh, became very popular in Europe uh, and especially in Italy uh, from the first half of the 16th century. So starting from 1520 in the building site from Raffaello, it came out the stucco can, um, um, can allow wonderful decoration system. And um, stucco, as you can see here, is basically a lime and sand mixture, extremely plastic and inexpensive, that was used to create uh, architectural or three-dimensional decoration in imitation of marble. And here in this image, you can see the supporting structure made of uh, wood, uh, bricks, uh, or metal. And on this uh, supporting structure, uh, the lime plaster made of lime and river sand uh, is applied in two layers. Uh, we've always found uh, a ground layer and uh, as, um, and has uh, a finish layer in which uh, instead of sand, uh, ground marble is added as aggregate. So probably something you are familiar with. We have manual and printed treatises. So from the Roman time, from Vitruvio to quite a modern area like Rondelet that help us uh, to give a better comprehension of the original technique. But these uh, sources, uh, by their nature, retain a general and widespread knowledge uh, that is far away from the complex reality of a single object uh, that are really precisely described uh, only in the documents uh, from the worksite. In our research, we found uh, that only through the reading of archival sources, it is possible to find information that could, be, that could not be obtained uh, in any other way. In certain cases, for example, the documents describe basic details, uh, uh, even about uh, those uh, who performed uh, the minor tasks, like uh, uh, the payments uh, to a manual laborer for the watering of uh, the plaster on celebration days, uh, like on Sunday, uh, when the work on site uh, was, uh, was prohibited uh, at that time by the church, uh, because they didn't want it was really a bad thing to work on Saturday and Sundays. So this person was paid to, to take the plasters wet in order they can set in um, more gradually and then um, to, be, uh, to be stronger after the setting. So this is apparent and an insignificant detail. However, it is an essential type of information that shows the care with which uh, even a great artist, uh, in this case we are speaking uh, of uh, Pietro da Cortona in Palazzo Pitti, so one of the greatest artists, he was caring and monitoring uh, the realization of the stucco work. 
And these fragments of information are important to make us understand the technique. Otherwise, just with scientific analysis or with visual examination, we don't get all this information. Um, one of the main sources of information are the contracts uh, between the community commission, commissioning the work and the stucco master. Here, there is an example out of many. And it is important to mention that the stucco maker promised to realize the stucco decoration according to his own drawing. So in many cases, we have found uh, that these stucco masters uh, were not only working together with architect, but they were independent designer, able to conceive and realize such an important stucco decoration. The stucco decoration was presented to the community and to the church. The drawing was approved, signing it, and also the community sometimes did some changes in the decoration. So for example, I'd like uh, um, such and such uh, details. Um, and then from this information, from these contracts, uh, we know also the working schedule. We know that uh, the decorator, to realize um, a chapel like this, uh, he had uh, a time span of six months. Also, then he just uh, realized in three months. But in principle, they gave him the opportunity to, to do in six months. And uh, about the salaries, so stucco makers had quite good salaries, comparable to the salaries of other artists. And uh, the clients had to provide all the materials, so the stucco maker didn't uh, uh, bring his own materials, but he was giving the, the owners just like a shopping list. Uh, I need this, this, this and that. And then uh, he, the, the community was providing all the stonemasons uh, and um, a boy to pound uh, the gypsum in order to get gypsum powder. And um, they had to give accommodation to the stucco master and his assistant and um, to give accommodation and wine also. And these terms and conditions are essentially repeated in all the contracts uh, we have. And these documents give also a lot of important information about materials, like uh, type and quantity, sometimes also about the provenance. In these documents, for example, oops, uh, you have uh, uh, gypsum that has been cooked and pounded. You know, we have marble powder and iron bars. Uh, so they specify a lot of things. Then we can, um, can be helpful also to do tests on these materials. If we know that a certain material is coming from that quarry, then we can test the material and uh, in other materials where we can find the same properties and features, probably we can say it, it could come from, from, that, from that area. And for the building sites uh, situated um, south of Lugano, uh, the lime and the bricks uh, were coming uh, from Viva San Vitale, this area that is uh, very rich uh, in uh, an area rich in clay. And the same knills uh, used to cook terracotta to make bricks uh, or tiles, uh, they were used uh, to cook a very special dolomitic lime we find in, uh, in this area that was used uh, to make uh, stucco, magnesitic man lime. And the gypsum was taken mainly from Nobiallo, this area, but we had other quarries uh, in, uh, in these areas uh, as well. Marble flakes uh, were coming from Musso, here. And uh, here I just uh, put an image of a wonderful pounder and a sieve uh, used to prepare marble powder. And this is an image uh, 
by in a, that I found in an ancient treatise of architecture dated 1590 that was just showing what was uh, usual to have uh, so a pounder and a sieve uh, and you have uh, there you can have uh, marble powder with different oops with different marble powder with different granulometry oops what is that well and uh, Mm. Nails and iron bars were coming mainly from, from Lecco and from Como, all the pigments, gold and particular items. In other case studies, we didn't find particular attention to the materials and the use before making stucco decoration. And uh, when we compare it, uh, what they, so I have, if you can please mute, or I, I have uh, to mute all participants. Uh, again, uh, okay. So in our case study, we didn't find uh, so, attention so much attention to materials and their preparation but when we read the architectural treatise we find a lot of information about uh, the kind of stone with which lime was made uh, or the time the lime has to be slaked one year before using it uh, they wanted sand to come from a certain quarry of another and it is important that our masterwork instead, they didn't care about it. In all the documents, we did not find any attention for a particular time of uh, lime or stone. They were just very flexible and probably very able to use and adapt uh, all the materials uh, they had. Oop. Also in the contract, um, working tools uh, are never mentioned uh, and they were part uh, of uh, the personal belongings uh, of uh, the stucco maker. Here an image from a treatise of uh, 1676 and it is incredible how now we use uh, the same tools uh, as uh, were indicated in 1690. And uh, here are some of the traces on the surface uh, left uh, by the tools. And in some cases we even found uh, uh, fingerprints uh, of, uh, of the suco makers. So from uh, archival written sources, uh, we got a lot of precious information about materials. But what if we have to detect materials in a case where there are no written sources? The first help is, of course, visual inspection. And in cases with a strong level of decay are important as we can see internal structure and composition which is not easy to read uh, with other tools, uh, as we will see in the next uh, slide. So we can see from different case study that the support structure is made out of bricks or stone. And here the brick you see has been uh, broken in order to get uh, closer to the form of, uh, of uh, the molding. In this case, for example, some round bricks were used and nails. Here is another round brick in order to have the decoration of the capitals. In this case as well, a simple brick already shaped as the architectural decoration. Here you see it helps a lot the fasting, uh, so the, um, the, um, to make to work quick, as uh, you need to just uh, the last uh, finishing layer. No ground layer is needed here. 
and uh, here I hope you can see well the image of the treatise of 15 of uh, 1676 in which you can see the different uh, um, the different uh, uh, stones and bricks shaped in a way that you can mix them in order to get uh, all the architectural decoration of, of a Cornish. And um, if the work has bolder relief, the master has to fix um, iron support uh, or other armatures uh, which hold the stucco suspended in the air. And sometimes, uh, like uh, in these cases, uh, or in this beautiful hand, you see the internal structure, how is it made? And sometimes we find the use of fibers or ropes to connect the metal bars and to protect them from oxidation, like here. We also found the use of fibers for very protruding elements, for example, a wing like this needs to be very light and flexible. And in these cases also fibers were used. Um, in some other cases, uh, we, we have found uh, uh, wooden, um, in wooden support, uh, but wooden support are less flexible than iron. Like uh, here, for example, you have a wooden support, uh, but uh, normally to, to go and uh, shape uh, the, um, uh, the figure, iron is used. Or like uh, here or here. Well, we made some tests uh, to detect uh, iron bars uh, um, to the internal of the surfaces. And so we used uh, a portable, a movable, X-ray device in order to make radiography. Um, here you can see the blackboard behind exactly when you go to a doctor and you need a radiography. So you, you, you place it. I hope you can see my mouse. Um, you place a blackboard behind and then with this uh, instrument uh, you just uh, send uh, the X-ray. And uh, this is uh, the result. So the original part uh, and the X-ray. You see exactly the shape, uh, which is, um, I mean, with this um, um, special profile, so of, of, uh, of the iron bar. And here you can see that the iron bar is not uh, um, going perfectly inside the material and the stucco is not covering uh, very well the iron bar. That's why we had uh, some problems in, in this case. But also from uh, a radiography, you can see also the um, cracks, uh, the small cracks and fissures, fissures uh, on, uh, in the stucco surface. Uh, and what it is was extremely interesting and we'll need further research on that is that we couldn't uh, detect uh, the cracks uh, and this uh, discontinuity on the real on the work of art so it seems uh, that these instruments allow us to see more discontinuity that we can see with uh, our bare eye and uh, here's some other images where you can see the iron bars, but also the very small metal wire using the two, um, to, um, to bind together the, the, different, uh, the different bars, uh, as you can see here. Um, here you can see this, uh, the shape of this uh, element that was uh, used, uh, it's like, uh, I mean, uh, reinforced uh, metal bar that uh, allows uh, it can be easily bended and twisted accordingly to the shape uh, an artist wanted to uh, to realize and uh, here another image again 
and uh, we also used uh, the first devices i will show you it's an analogical device so the the mm, the, the plate, the blackboard, the boards uh, had to be taken to a photographer and developed. Uh, and so you, you have uh, the really the, the normal um, X-ray uh, that, that you can go out of uh, from the doctor with your X-rays. So it's really the same thing. But we also tried another device, uh, which is digital, not analogical. And so it's, uh, it's very small comparing to the other one I showed you before. And so here you have the source of X-ray. Here we have a mock-up test. I will talk about this mock-up test later. And then the image is going to, I mean, to, to this board. And there is a scan where you scan the image coming from the X-ray machine and the image is going directly on the computer. So you can have in real time the information you have collected. Otherwise, with the first system I showed you, it's much more precise, but if you make something wrong or probably if you want to calibrate the input of your X-ray or other parameters, then you need uh, to go back on site again and do the same procedure again. Here you can do on, on real time. So here then on the computer, you work uh, with uh, dark and white, black and white, uh, contrast uh, and color in order to get a good image. And if the image is not satisfying for you, you can do the X-ray again on the surface. Here, um, as I said, uh, we did also mock-ups in order to understand. This is a, um, a technique not widely used uh, in stucco decoration or in the studying or of uh, uh, immovable heritage. To make X-rays quite common if you study uh, painting, um, especially on wood, uh, you have uh, or a statue, but not stucco decoration. So stucco is also is very um, strong and compact material, which is not easy to uh, be um, um, to be transversed. Uh, so it's not so transparent uh, to X-ray. And so we did some mockups uh, where we put a lot of materials that are used normally as uh, support uh, for stucco decoration. And for example, we, uh, we put some iron bars, uh, um, nails, uh, ropes, uh, but also pieces of bricks uh, and wood uh, and in a cage. And then we put our stucco in that cage and then we did our, our X-ray in order to see how is it possible to see the different materials. And we noticed that iron bars, uh, but also the very, very, very small iron wires, uh, you have a perfect uh, legibility. So they come out in an X-ray in a wonderful way, also if they are very tiny fragments, but instead uh, for bricks uh, or, uh, or wooden structure, they are not so uh, permeable to X-rays, uh, and we need the uh, final research to adapt uh, uh, these, uh, um, these tools. Because bricks, uh, you can read it, but not so well. Well, um, when the artist wishes to product uh, a composition in a bas relief uh, on a flat wall, he first has to insert uh, numerous nails, uh, projecting less or more according uh, to the figures to be arranged in order to hold the coarse stucco, which afterwards he goes on refining until it consolidates. And here are some images of the nails being used. And to detect the presence of these nails, we used um, um, a pacometer, 
so or cofermeter which is very largely used in um, in the analysis of um, reinforced uh, concrete structures uh, so because it uh, helps you to read uh, the metal inside a surface uh, the problems of this uh, instrument is that the instrument is uh, is flat uh, and is used uh, normally for 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 concrete so on flat surfaces uh, and we had to use in three dimensional elements uh, but we could get um, quite interesting information also about that and then uh, after visual inspection and non-invasive analysis, which is we are trying to do as much as possible, as you will see also in the next communication done by, by my colleagues, uh, we go on site uh, and take samples. Of course, uh, taking sample is a very selective method because uh, you can't uh, take uh, many, many samples. You have to decide exactly the places where you want to take samples and you can just take a few of them like here in this image uh, we also always try to take sample in a place where we don't uh, destroy where we don't make any disturb uh, to the original work of art and uh, we will make um, chemical petrographical analysis and about that uh, my colleague Marta Caroselli will stay, speak better about this part uh, and uh, on June the 17th. So here you can see different uh, uh, levels, uh, the ground and internal layer, so it's composed uh, with sand uh, and uh, we saw very a lot of differences in, uh, in composition. At the beginning of the project, we assumed, yes, all the materials, we will find all, all the, the same materials, but that was not true. At the end of our research, we found an enormous variety of materials and methods of, uh, of working them. And uh, also, um, we, um, I, I said before, the composition is mainly lime and sand, but we also find a lot of gypsum being used, uh, especially in the internal layer. And uh, sometimes uh, through visual inspection, we have the impression that also organic additives uh, have been used uh, because the stucco is, is very plastic and just with lime, sand and gypsum, you can't realize uh, such uh, very small uh, and uh, wonderful detail. And so from the manual, uh, we have the, the information that uh, additives were used, uh, like um, casein, milk, uh, eggs, uh, oils, uh, sometimes glue. And we try to do some tests uh, on these materials uh, to analyze them. We used a special FTIR transformation system, uh, but um, also we, we used a, a particular variation in this technique, uh, preparing the samples uh, in a solution, but uh, we, we were not certain. We just had few results, uh, or we used this uh, protein based uh, technique called dot ELISA um, to detect uh, protein through different uh, re reagents, but um, results uh, were not uh, completely satisfied and we have to have more research about it. Because especially these uh, additives uh, were added uh, to the stucco composition, just in small quantities, uh, and uh, they also, during uh, time, they aged, uh, they mineralized, uh, they changed the properties, and so now it's very difficult to, to detect them. Um, here we could uh, also find an interesting uh, um, confirmation from what uh, manuals describe about stucco decoration. 
So Manuel's uh, invites two co-decorators to work uh, fresco su fresco. So with uh, starting uh, with uh, modeling the ground layer and adding the finishing layer when the ground layer is, uh, is still soft and wet. And so here with uh, from this uh, section, we can see that uh, effectively they, we, we have many, um, we did many tests and uh, our stucco makers were working really fresco su fresco. Um, here is what uh, happens if uh, you don't work fresco su fresco, so the, um, the stucco is going to detach the, from the wall. Um, also with the replica, we focused our attention to understand uh, how the introduction of a certain quantity of gypsum influenced the working properties of a plaster for stucco decoration. And um, working with the replica allowed us uh, to also to empirically evaluate uh, when the plasticity of the mixture change, uh, for example, how long it remains uh, wet uh, and how much it dries more quickly. And so from the work, uh, this really practical work on making replicas, uh, uh, we could understand that gypsum was used uh, in different percentage, uh, even inside the same work of art. So we can't uh, find the recipe typical from the stucco maker A, B or C. Every stucco maker had sort of variety of recipes that they used in a very dynamic way, just changing according to the weather. Is today is wet or dry? Is today cold or warm? Is, um, do I have to, to work quickly or can I take the time to model exactly and uh, take the time to to do the job or do I have to run to another building site and, uh, and do this as quickly as possible. And uh, so also it was a problem for us uh, because taking samples, uh, for example, from, uh, from here, we find uh, a certain uh, mix of materials that is difficult, different from samples taken here, for, for example. And just, uh, by doing and uh, came out uh, doing these experiments, uh, um, we could uh, understand why we find also so many differences in stucco composition from um, samples taken in different parts of, of a statue. And um, uh, to finish with, uh, I come back uh, with the same slide uh, uh, of uh, uh, I used at the beginning in order to understand that it's just the variety and combination of different sources that can allow us uh, to uh, define a sort of uh, material and composition and also to um, our aim is not just to know how stucco is made but of course to act in order to protect the stucco to um, um, uh, to be uh, preserved uh, for a very long time and also to design the more appropriate conservation restoration treatment. And that's why we have to understand this material. So I stop sharing uh, my screen and uh, thank you very much for your attention. And I no, don't know if uh, there are questions for me. Um. Thank you, can you hear me? Yes, very well. Thank you for a excellent talk. I think it was very informative uh, for an hour. There was, you covered a lot of topics. I'm sure that everybody is excited. We do have some questions. I'll uh, very quickly go through them. The first one is uh, the stuccos that we discussed, are these painted? I see some uh, gold embellishments. Could you please confirm that? Or are these tacos painted as well? Yes, this is um, a big question because uh, normally stucco make, making was done basically white and the use of gold was sometimes done later on 
when uh, um, the, the community had money. So if uh, there was a patron, a very rich client, uh, he normally used gold in order to show the importance. Gold, gold is really related to, I mean, I want to show you how much does it cost. It. <laughs> so we can find gold, but also silver, leaves, metal. And, um, and for the painting, normally there were white stucco, but just later, mainly on the statue of the different saints, they were painted. They were painted with uh, mainly with the oil technique. Thank you. We say uh, Kalpana Singh has this question. Uh, I wonder if thermal imaging was also tried to see the metal arm armature in the stucco. Or maybe is thermal imaging a method to detect metal armature in stucco? Thermal uh, image. Sorry, um, I had a bad hearing. Can you? She's asking if thermal imaging technique could be used to detect metal armature in stucco. Ah, th but you have to to take your stucco in a to make a tomato tomatography. Is it correct if I understood it correct? Uh, so tomatography is something you can't do on site. Uh, no, I think we also have certain cameras with the infrared thermal imaging. So just place them on the ah, and in, you find the yes. differences. So maybe she okay. means it's a simple technique used for detection of uh, metal pipes or water sources in buildings. Okay. No, no, now, now I got it. Sorry, I misunderstood the question. Yes, yes, we use a lot of uh, thermal camera, but uh, uh, not for stucco because uh, it has uh, the armatures have the same, uh, I mean, room temperature as um, as the stucco. We we did some tests, but we couldn't see any any metal bars uh, with the thermal camera. Okay, thank you. Another question is uh, a question on research on organic additives. Has there any research been published? If if yes, then could you please provide us a link? This okay. No, link. this uh, is something we are writing on it, uh, and it will be published uh, hopefully soon because uh, the article is almost uh, ready, and um, we will uh, yes we will provide it uh, information. But you can also see our internet site subsi uh, point uh, uh, ch ch, and uh, you can find research project. Uh, and publication. Okay. Um, then the question on different percentages of gypsum used in stucco work. Can you please explain how different percentages of gypsum were used and yes. how it kind of affected the stucco? Yes. So the different percentage uh, we did the uh, replica because uh, from uh, the samples we took, uh, we find, uh, I mean, different percentage, uh, but of course, uh, a bigger amount of stucco and a big amount of gypsum in the internal structure near the iron bars. Uh, so there, sometimes even we found uh, just uh, gypsum because it was a quick setting and they wanted just to, to shape them in order to get, uh, to get the, the, the idea of, uh, of the figure. Then uh, uh, the amount of gypsum is decreasing. We almost uh, didn't find any gypsum in the finishing layer. We just found it in the, um, in the first uh, coarse layer and the ground layer. And um, it, um, it depends, uh, but making replica, our stucco maker had a sort of, uh, I mean, a gypsum uh, bowl full of gypsum. And then he was adding a little bit uh, according to how strong uh, or how fast setting he, he wanted the, the stucco to be. And uh, so we have uh, seen that between five and 20%. So when we say a lot of gypsum, we, we think at something like 20%. Uh, if we say a little bit of gypsum, something like 5%. Uh. Thank you. A question from Mopi Mukhopadhyay. She wants to know, is it possible to determine 
preferential deterioration like black crust or a biofilm depending on different composition of the plaster and stucco or does the composition affect biodegradation maybe that's the question uh, no 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 we have been working also in um, in work site where a lot of water was present you see all the image of uh, decay I showed you and um, is not affecting uh, microbiological growth. The presence of stucco, um, of gypsum, sorry, with uh, the magnesic lime we have uh, is just uh, forming um, um, magnesite salts, salts uh, with uh, magnesium and, um, and gypsum. So um, this is very bad because we have a lot of salts in our stucco decoration. A lot of salts that you can easily remove because the salt is working like the consolidant for the stucco now. So it's not just an external grow of, stucco, of salts, but uh, salts and original material are mixed together is a transformation of the original material and um, now to remove uh, the salts uh, will mean to remove uh, almost uh, the material of the stucco and this is uh, really a big issue in conservation so we are working a lot of uh, on consolidation and so forth and does this uh, percentage of gypsum plaster affect the biodegradation growth on it? Have you seen no. Any change? No. No, 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 never, no. Also working in very humid environment, no. Okay, are there any other questions? Probably I can add something about uh, um, organic uh, additives. Uh, here what we really wanted to do is uh, to make a systematic um, test, a systematic replica really. If I add 5% uh, of egg yolk, if I add uh, 5, 10, 15, 20, how the mixture looks like uh, and how I can detect it uh, on uh, with, uh, I mean, with uh, FTR analysis of gas chromatography or other kind of analysis. Uh, and then to see both the working properties. So what happen if uh, I add uh, organic additives, uh, the different organic additives, uh, uh, how this affect uh, the working properties of the material? And the second point is how it will be detectable with the scientific instruments because here we had really big limits. Okay, uh, there's a question. Uh, have you observed any discoloration, any change in color in the stucco after conservation? And if yes, then what could the various reasons for this? If your stucco discolors after conservation? Mm. We, we have just a case study now. We mm, just started to work on a decoration in stucco of a chimney piece. And there, uh, after cleaning, some areas became uh, yellowish. Became, yes, they just uh, turned into a yellow color. And that is probably due to something contained uh, in the stucco mixture. And um, now we are just um, trying to remove and clean this uh, yellow layer that was, uh, of course, coming from inside to outside. Uh, but this is the only case we had. Otherwise, the normal conservation treatments normally do not lead to any discoloration, considering the fact it's white and no? No, no, no. We, I mean, as and far yet, as now, we didn't have problems. Uh, what are the organic additives or binders in stucco that one would find evidence of during scientific examination? What would you find? So what we find uh, some uh, oils, probably um, olive oil or linseed oil. Then we have found uh, some casein. Then we have found uh, some um, glue, like animal glue, and uh, some eggs. Okay. Um, so white uh, and uh, egg yolk. 
And then, of course, the fibers, maybe you also get the fibers. Ah, yes, that's right. They are organic, yes. Uh, fibers are um, um, linseed fibers and um, canapa fibers. Okay. No husk, straw, no, no evidence use of husk, straw, or any of those? No. So, uh, Conserved, uh, do you observe fine cracks in conserved stucco? Chances of uh, fine cracks when you conserve stucco? If yes, then how to avoid these? What are the reasons yeah. how to avoid them? Well, it depends very much uh, where the crack uh, comes from. So if you have small crack uh, already on the original surface, is because uh, the material, the finishing was too dry and uh, drying it, uh, so it causes, uh, um, we say it's, uh, it's, it's um, skinny, so it causes uh, like a shrinkage. Mm -hmm. And uh, not after treatment. Uh, so if you see these uh, small cracks after treatment, it means uh, that uh, you removed probably one of the finishing layer and uh, you, you removed too much, you did a much stronger, stronger cleaning. Mm. Okay. Uh, what are the normal consolidants that you may use in stucco conservation? What are the normal consolidating material that is used? To consolidate? It depends very much uh, from the problem you have. Uh, we um, use the um, as ethyl silicates and uh, is working uh, very well in many cases and uh, or nano limes it depends very much uh, it's uh, it's not a question of uh, using a certain material some stucco but uh, it depends from the composition of stucco the kind of sand you have uh, many many so from many different uh, um, things. Okay. Uh, most of the organic additives that you found, are these only proteinaceous in nature, proteins, or have you found some other groups? You did mention fats. So I think uh, anything else that you find except proteins, organic no. additives? No, but also so organic additives, uh, we, we have to work uh, more on this. Uh, and okay. No, but any, we just uh, any literature available on consolidants for stucco? Can you recommend any literature or any research that's been done at SUPSI mm -hmm. right now? No, we um, we are publishing uh, articles, uh, but uh, as far as now, just little research has been done on stucco decoration because normally stucco decoration was not. Uh, conserved uh, with the same attention that you pay to a wall paintings, for example. Mm -hmm. And uh, so they j was just uh, redone or repainted. Uh, that was uh, the most uh, frequent uh, things uh, we could see. But redone, it was redone by gypsum mainly because it was quicker and easy to work with. And, um, and so the stucco decoration, so it's not so nice. A very good stucco decoration is really, is really like ivory. It's really like stone. It's a wonderful surface qualities. Uh, it's not just like uh, redoing it in gypsum. And uh, repainting is, um, I mean, it's making all the surfaces very um, flat and um, glossy. And so now uh, stucco is in conservation restoration, we pay attention to stucco conservation. A uh, very interesting question. Uh, Rajiv Chaudhary is saying, uh, we find that iron was used to make Armature earlier, if we were to replace it with a non resting material now, what would you recommend? No, well, we use uh, some, uh, some bars uh, to help reinforcement, uh, but uh, I mean, the iron bars uh, are really inside the structure, so you have to do the structure and the decoration again. If you want to, to make, uh, to use uh, bars as a consolidant, you can use fiberglass. Uh, we use uh, small pins uh, of fiberglass. Uh. Otherwise, iron can be used 
do you recommend that iron can be used even for conservation? Um, yes, if you protect uh, the iron, you can use it. Uh, or you can use um, steel. Any other questions? I think um, all that's left for me to then say is thank you. Thank, thank you. you. I don't have any other questions. Uh, thank, thank you, you to everybody. Or if you have other question, you can send me an email. Also in the future. Yeah, I'll, I'll pass the thing. And uh, thank you everyone for joining us. So the next lecture is on the 10th. Yes. Well,